If you like the look of this furniture now, you should probably not watch the rest of this video because it might upset you. So I've worked on a lot of dressers. They can start out looking pretty rough. This one was no exception. I bought it from another furniture refinisher. She was thinning out her inventory and let me tell you, she had some great pieces. But because they'd been in her storage unit for a while, they were pretty dirty. But I went looking for a dresser set a lot like this because I had an idea. And if I can pull it off, you are not going to recognize this when I'm done. I'm Amy. I build and revive furniture, often adding something new to something old. I'm sharing tips, tricks, and methods on how to give old pieces a new lease on life. Welcome to my shop. So I always try to leave at least some real wood, if there is any, when I'm refinishing a piece. But I had something different in mind for this project, so I wanted to make sure I wasn't going to be painting over anything that could be saved. Don't be fooled. This burl, it's actually fake. I've refinished a few pieces like this before. As soon as you start sanding or stripping off the old finish, that burl texture comes right off. It's very realistic looking, but it's some kind of a faux finish. What I really like about this piece is the bones. All the drawers are deep and roomy, and you can see the frame, the drawers, and even the drawer slides are all solid wood. So even though I don't like the fake burl or this two-tone look, these pieces still have great potential. You can see one of the cabinet door hinges is missing, so it looks like I'll be replacing this, which is fine because the cabinet doors are gonna get quite a makeover. There are some real issues with the veneer being bubbled in some spots. This is because moisture has gotten down into this narrow crevice under the veneer and it's caused the substrate to swell. And you can see here the substrate isn't even solid wood. This side is pretty rough. The veneer is bubbled and there's a lot of surface scratches. The first step is to remove the cabinet doors and the hardware before giving everything a good thorough cleaning. Here I'm using crud cutter, then rinsing any residue with warm water. With vintage furniture, the drawers are usually numbered at the factory because they're custom fit to each cavity. And if you try to put them in the wrong spot, they won't sit right. But the numbers are on the underside and they're kind of hard to see, so I'm just remarking the drawers here to make it easier. Now that they're clean, I'll start repairing the veneer. I'm sanding each spot until it's level with the rest of the surface, even though in most places that means I'm sanding all the way through the veneer to the substrate. The goal here is to get a level surface. Now, because I'll be painting these pieces, I can use Bondo to seal off where the substrate is exposed. Bondo is a two-part wood filler that's pretty easy to apply and dries rock hard in about 20 to 30 minutes. The only drawback is that it sets up pretty quickly, so you want to work in small batches. It also has a noxious smell that's pretty unhealthy to inhale, so definitely wear PPE and make sure there's some fresh air. Since I'm replacing the hardware, I'm also using Bondo to fill the old hardware holes. After I sanded down all the excess filler, I gave everything a scuff sanding with 150 grit to get it ready for primer and paint. So I work out of my two car garage. Roughly half the garage is my work area for all my tools and a large work table. And this other half is where I do all the paint spraying. I'm just using Ram board here to protect the floors from overspray. It'll last me a few months before it needs to be replaced. I also have a ceiling mounted curtain track and I use large canvas drop cloths to help contain the overspray. So what I usually do is apply a coat of primer, then I go back over each piece with more Bondo or this spot filler to fill anything I missed. And as you can see, I missed a lot. This spot filler dries really fast and sands smooth before my next coat of primer. These drawer and cabinet fronts are now really plain, so here's where I'm gonna add some wood back into the design. 
I used Adobe Illustrator to sketch out a geometric pattern and help me figure out how much wood I was going to need. And I'm going to need a lot, <laughs> 160 linear feet. The strips are going to be an inch and a half wide by about a quarter of an inch thick. To keep this from costing an absolute fortune, I'm going to use basic 2x4 lumber, which means I only needed to buy about four to five 2x4s. I could have used more expensive lumber and maybe next time I will, but this is the first time I'm doing something like this. So I wanted to make sure it was gonna work, that I'm happy with the result and that it's worth the investment. To be clear, I don't recommend building furniture with basic framing lumber, but this is decorative, not structural. Besides utilizing basic table saw safety, let me show you a few more things about how I'm making these cuts safely. I'm also gonna link a few safety videos in the video description. I replace my table saw's throat plate with what's called a zero clearance insert. This helps keep those pieces from falling down into the saw blade or getting stuck in between the blade and the plate. This one is made out of MDF and honestly, it's not the best quality. I need to invest in a metal one now that I know it's something I'll use more often. When you're ripping stock down through a table saw, you want both pieces to be secure. This jig has a roller guide bearing on the tip to make feeding the stock through easy and smooth. And I don't have to have my fingers anywhere near the blade through the entire cut. Also, when you're trying to cut small pieces, it's really important to do it safely. Never ever try to cut a small part like this on any kind of saw because your hand is gonna be way too close to the blade. If you need a small piece, it's best to cut it from the end of a long piece so your hand can stay well away from the blade. All right, now it's time to start laying out the patterns. It was way easier to cut each strip at a rough length on my miter saw than make the angled cuts on my table saw. For all these angled cuts, I'm using my miter gauge set at 45 degrees. I wanted the doors to be as symmetrical as possible, so I started by marking the vertical center of each door. I placed the first slat, then I went back and trimmed it to size. Then I use that slat as a template to make three more. Maybe there's a more efficient way to do this, but this is the only way I know how, and that's to individually measure each piece, trim, and then set it in place, one by one. I'm using glue and brad nails to secure them in place. And stay tuned on that. You're gonna see a big screw up here in a few minutes. For the dresser drawers, I wanted a seamless pattern that carried from the top drawer to the bottom. And to be honest, this was not easy. I got about halfway through and I wish I would have done something a bit more efficient. By the time I got to the nightstand drawers, I figured out how to modify the pattern so I could batch more cuts. And this took a lot less time. Okay, I know this looks pretty janky, but I don't have the right kind of sander, so I improvised. I just wanted to ease the hard edges on all the slats so you could see the individual pieces once they were in place. But yes, this also took forever. And now I'll glue and nail each piece in place and fill a million little nail holes. Last step for the drawers is drilling new hardware holes. I'm just using a cheap template I found on Amazon and a center punch to mark the holes before drilling. I always drill the hardware holes before painting or clear coating because if you make a mistake, it's way easier to fix at this stage. And I promised to show you a big screw up and here it is. I miscalculated what size nails to use for the cabinet doors and because they were too long, most of them poke through the back of the doors. So how am I gonna fix this? Well, I could take a hammer and punch them back through, but then they'll just poke through the front. I could try to remove them, but that'll just tear up the wood and these doors would be ruined. The only tool I had was this old metal file. I don't know what you're supposed to use this for, but I used it to file the nails down so that they were at least level with the surface. And then I filled all the gouges with wood filler, I sanded and reprimed. I'm a full-time furniture builder and refinisher, but when I was starting out, I painted pieces for my own home with chalk paint and I brushed by hand. And if you're just doing small projects, I recommend investing in a good set of brushes and use paint that's made to be applied by hand. But if you're planning on doing several pieces, a big project, or even turning this into a hobby or a side hustle, I would recommend a paint sprayer. 
There are quite a few options available at different price points and it's pretty easy to find reviews and videos on how to use them. For the cabinet doors and drawer fronts, I wanted to see a lot of the wood grain, so I just did very light coats of paint on those areas. Then when it dried, I sanded it back by hand with 220 grit sandpaper. After three coats of paint dried, I hung the cabinet doors and installed the hardware. So, here's a quick look at where we started, and here's how it looks now. When it was all done, I was stunned at how different it looked. I don't think they look like the same pieces at all, and I love how the paint color blends with the natural wood grain. But this was a lot of work. Do you think it was worth it? Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'm always working on something new. If you wanna see more furniture transformations, please make sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.